The global context of the digital revolution can be looked at from two levels. So we have what I call the big systemic level that has to do with the historical context of where we're coming from. For example, colonialism, still important to consider. An economical context, for example, industrialism and how that has happened and is happening. A social context, for example, the current situation of global mobility. And a political context, global governance. So these are very important context that the digital revolution has to consider or is confronted with. And then there's also the small, what I call the activists, the micro levels so that has to do with projects, aid, resource allocation, initiatives of specific individuals and specific governments that also do make a difference. Using an analogy, you can think about these two different levels the following way. So imagine globalization as being a beach and um, in this beach with an ocean suddenly some change is happening. Globalization, technological progress in our case. In the case of this analogy, imagine the ocean would be rising and the starfish, sea stars, are flushed onto the beach constantly where they are dying. So we have a problem. Where does it come from? Well, it's just provoked by change. So there are several ways we can go about it. Uh, one is we can study why the ocean has been rising. So we do studies, academics do that, researchers and international institutions do that, government researchers do that as well, research institutes. We try to understand where does it actually come from? What's the problem? And by now actually we understand a lot about where it comes from. But that doesn't tell us a lot what to do about it. Even if, it, if we know what to do about it, it doesn't mean that we do something about it. So there's another level that also tries to aim at turning at the big wheels. Of course, if we could stop the sea from rising, perfect. Uh, but maybe we don't have this possibility, so we try to create a big machine and try to push some starfish back into the ocean, but maybe there's a trade-off. Maybe in this process we kill half of them, but we save half of them. And, and that's very effective. So this has to do with policies, with global governance structures, with activities from governments. So, so that's what we can do on this, on this big level. And then on the actives on the small level, it has to do with the guy who comes to the beach and picks up one of the starfish and throws it back into the ocean. And another guy says, what are you doing? That's completely such a waste of time. There are thousands of starfish coming to the ocean each minute. You think you're going to make a difference by throwing them back? And the guy says, well, for this one, for this one, it doesn't make a difference. And he throws it back. So this is very important work done, for example, by NGO, by philanthropists that also through this work, then we better understand what's actually happening. And when we do a lot of it, maybe that's also the solution. So these are different levels that we work on in globalization. And the result is that we have some areas and some sectors, some challenges that are rather flatteners of the world and unflatteners of the world that make the world more equal and more unequal as well in this process of globalization. So let's start with the first aspect of the global context of the digital age with the historical context. Colonialism plays a very big role there. So, but let's start all the way back, all the way at the beginning. So, so where did we all start? We all started 65,000 years ago all together here in Africa. And we were all at the same conditions, completely equal. So there were no global inequality or, or, or different levels of development. We were pretty much, pretty much the same. And then some of us went to Europe, some of us went to Asia, some of us down to Australia, some of us continued to North America 15,000 years ago, then arriving in South America. And different cultures developed. And some societies had some different pressures, different need, and they all found different standardized solutions to typical problems, which they derived from knowledge about the world and embedded into physical structures. They developed some technologies which allowed them to liberate important resources. And with that, with all the time they then had on their hands, they could do other things, create civilization, uh, build architecture, create industries, and also go around the world and out of curiosity, start to explore, look for more efficient trade routes. And that's actually where colonialism then also started.
And the two centuries after the first and second industrial revolution were completely dominated by this logic of colonialism. So especially Western countries went out with their technologies, started to dominate, to exploit other countries, really take out their resources, also kill or enslave the inhabitants of, of, of these other territories. And some of these countries, they still have debt nowadays that comes from these times some debt, because these times are also not too long ago. In 1945, there was still, that's the end of the Second World War, there was still a lot of colonialism going on in the world, especially in Africa and in some Caribbean countries. So uh, this surely led to the fact that there were now much more unequal starting positions uh, where we started this globalization process from. Now, many people say, okay, now you come again with your colonialism, that's okay now, it's gone, it's over, let's, let's, let's stop that it's slavery and all that stuff that we, have to, that we have to listen to in high school for such a long time, that's, that's okay now. So let's look at that, let's look at slavery, for example. Well, slavery surely doesn't exist anymore nowadays, or does it? Many people say that slavery exists today and that actually it is much worse than 150 years ago when it was officially abolished. So let's have a look at that claim. For example, between 1600 and 1800, a slave cost between $15,000 and $200,000 if you would calculate it in today's money, so adjusting for inflation and so forth. So on average, a slave would cost around $40,000. Well, that's a pretty good income, annual income, the income of many, many families. Uh, or to have another analogy, it's, it's a very, very nice car that you can get for $40,000. So only the very rich people could afford to have slaves. Some of them were so rich they had several slaves or many slaves. People like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, they all had slaves, but uh, they were not the normal workers. They were extremely rich people. So... And during that time, some 10 million Africans arrived in the US. Now, how is it today? Today, you can buy a human being, basically, uh, for between thirty dollars and $1,900. So, for example, debt bondage, forced labor, or sex workers. You can get for, on average, let's say, $350. And it's not 10 million. Nowadays, it is estimated that 30 million people are living in illegal slavery today. So in terms of price and in terms of also of dimension, human trafficking and the fact that people are enslaved is, is, is much more pervasive even now than when slavery was officially abolished 150 years ago. Now, guess where these people come from? sex worker, forced labor, they traditionally, most of the time, they don't come from highly developed countries, from the former colonial masters. They come pretty much from very similar countries on where traditionally slaves also came from and, and some new poor countries. And yeah, many people claim that slavery is still very much alive today.